On behalf of the Church of St. Andrew and St. Paul, I welcome you warmly to this service of worship today. Je vous souhaite bienvenue à ce culte de célébration de la part de l'Église de St. Andrew and St. Paul aujourd'hui. As you can see, I am recording this on a day of beautiful sunshine, lighting up freshly fallen snow, reminding us of the words of the prophet Isaiah, Arise, your light has come. God's glory has shone upon you. Let us worship God and let us pray. Glorious God, the secret is out. Your light has split the darkness, and those who couldn't see now have seen your truth revealed. You have revealed yourself in human life to show us that far from being a remote and distant God who directs the universe without caring, you are the God who comes close, giving freely of yourself for the creatures you love. With our ancestors through the generations, with people of every language and every color, every age and every type, we come to praise you revealed to us in Jesus Christ. God, when your light shines on us, sometimes it reveals things that we would rather keep hidden. Under its glare, we see our greed and selfishness, our laziness and apathy, our unwillingness to help others. We see our trust in false gods and unwillingness to live as your children. Yet our only hope is that forgiveness is not only possible, it's what Christ came to reveal about you. While we can never take it for granted, given its great cost, we thank you that it is freely offered to all who seek it. Gracious God, we turn to you, trusting that we are freed from our past and new possibilities will be emerging. We pray that you would reveal more to us about what it means to be disciples of Christ and would give us the courage and vision to follow where he leads. And together we pray the prayer that Jesus taught all his disciples to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I'd just like to take a few moments to highlight just a number of the announcements that you can find in our bulletin for today. First, with regard to our sermon discussion group, it meets again tomorrow evening, and if you'd like to sign up for that discussion group, please follow the instructions in the bulletin. And then on Tuesday at 11 a.m., Ian, our associate minister, is continuing his very popular and very interesting discussion on faith and art, entitled creating our way through. And then two final announcements for next Sunday, St. Valentine's Day, Sunday the 14th of February. Just after the service at 12 noon, I will be hosting another virtual coffee and conversation. And then at 3 p.m. there will be a virtual tour of St. Stephen's Cathedral in Vienna. If you're interested in any of these announcements or indeed any other events that we are hosting, please check out the bulletin and indeed our website. Let us continue to worship God.
La première lecture est du livre de Hébreu, chapitre 2, versets 14 à 18. Écoutons la parole de Dieu. Puisque ses enfants ont en commun la condition humaine, lui-même l'a aussi partagé de façon similaire. Ainsi, par sa mort, il a pu rendre impuissant celui qui exerçait le pouvoir de la mort, c'est-à-dire le diable, et libérer tous ceux que la peur de la mort retenait leur vie durant dans l'esclavage. En effet, assurément, ce n'est pas à des anges qu'il vient en aide, mais bien à la descendance d'Abraham. Par conséquent, il devait devenir semblable en tout à ses frères afin d'être un grand prêtre rempli de compassion et fidèle dans le service de Dieu pour faire l'expiation des péchés du peuple. En effet, comme il a souffert lui-même lorsqu'il a été tenté, il peut secourir ceux qui sont tentés. La parole de Dieu, rendons grâce à Dieu. The second lesson is from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 2, verse 22 to 40. Listen for God's Word. When the time came for the purification rites required by the law of Moses, Joseph and Mary took him to Jerusalem 
to present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every firstborn male is to be consecrated to the Lord and to offer a sacrifice in keeping with what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of doves or two young pigeons. Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was on him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Messiah. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all nations, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against, so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. And a sword will pierce your own soul too. There was also a prophet, Anna, the daughter of Penuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was very old. She had lived with her husband seven years after her marriage, and then was a widow until she was 84. She never left the temple, but worshipped night and day, fasting and praying. Coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. When Joseph and Mary had done everything required by the law of the Lord, they returned to Galilee, to their own town of Nazareth. And the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was on him. Amen. Here ends the second lesson. The Word of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Incarnate God, we celebrate the breathtaking news that somehow you were embodied in the person of Jesus to know and experience all that we know and experience. It is a story too mysterious for us to understand, yet in him we sense the bonding of the divine and human. And we thank you that he experienced every stage of the human journey. We thank you that Jesus was an infant, crying for his mother's milk, tottering and falling as he learned to walk, babbling sounds that became words. We pray for the infants of our world, God. We pray especially for those who are abandoned by parents unable to cope. Teach us to provide circles of belonging in which they feel safe and secure. We thank you that Jesus was a teenager, hanging out with friends, finding his own independence and sense of self, taking his first responsibilities as an adult. We pray for the teenagers of our world, God. We pray for those seeking self-worthiness, desperately unhappy, wondering if life is worth living. 
We pray for those so worried about what they look like, they risk their own health. We pray for those isolated by this pandemic, losing interest in school and activities, spending endless hours in front of screens, losing touch with true human connection. Teach us to provide circles of belonging where they will be listened to and supported. We thank you that Jesus was an adult, taking on responsibilities, struggling with difficult ethical choices, seeking to be faithful to you in circumstances where that was often very difficult. We pray for adults in our world. We pray for world leaders struggling with how to contain a virus that is out of control, trying to balance maintaining health with human freedom. We pray for men and women losing jobs and unable to provide for family and loved ones. We pray for parents seeking to do the best for their children. Teach us to provide circles of belonging where they feel supported to make difficult decisions and to live faithful to you. We thank you that Jesus knew death, understanding its fear of the unknown, facing its uncertainty, learning its mystery. We pray for those who are sick and dying. May they be supported in their journey by friends and family and health care personnel. Teach us how to accompany them in love as they leave this life and move into the unknown, where faith becomes your greatest gift. May we provide circles of belonging to those who are dying, that they might not journey alone, but know that you walk with them. And finally, we thank you that Jesus knew resurrection, victory over death, and opening the path for all to follow. We hold before you those whom we know who have died, May we trust that they are safe with you and know a depth of love and belonging beyond anything they experienced in this life. May we have faith to trust you in your promise of resurrection and in Jesus' example. And it is in his name that we offer these prayers today. Amen.
The story of Jesus' presentation in the temple at Jerusalem is one of only a few stories that we have about his childhood. It sits with the stories of his circumcision and naming, the visit of the Magi, and the subsequent escape of his family to Egypt, and then finally his getting lost in the temple at the age of 12. From Luke's Gospel, we learn that Mary and Joseph bring Jesus to the temple so that they can present him to the Lord. This tradition came from the law of Moses, where a child was presented in memory of the Exodus, that time when the children of Israel escaped to freedom from Egypt just after all firstborn Egyptian children were killed. The people of Israel gave thanks to God for releasing them from captivity by bringing their first child to the temple as a sign that they would forever be faithful to God. Mary also came to the temple that day with another intent, to be purified, an act also in accordance with the law. Because according to the law, a woman was unclean for a set period after giving birth. After that time then, she had to go to a priest in the temple with a lamb and a bird, either a pigeon or a turtle dove. The priest would then offer these on her behalf, and she would then be clean. However, if a woman could not afford a lamb, she could, like Mary, give two birds instead. So Jesus is brought to the temple by his parents in order that the family be acknowledged as fulfilling the law and the prophets. And while there, Simeon, guided by God's spirit, appears and proclaims Jesus to be a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to the people of Israel. The prophet Anna also then arrives. And we're not told what she says exactly, only that she too praises God and speaks about Jesus to everyone in Jerusalem who will listen. So we have this image of an encounter between a young couple and their child and an elderly couple within the sacred space of the temple. But what is startling in this generational encounter is Simeon's direct words to Mary. This child is destined for the falling and the rising of many in Israel, he says, and to be a sign that will be opposed so that the inner thoughts of many will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. This last part is especially alarming as it alludes to the moment a soldier would shove a spear into Jesus' side as he would hang dying on the cross. To be told that both you and your child will face suffering and possibly death sometime in the future is both alarming and unsettling. Just before I came to minister here at the Church of St Andrew and St Paul, I took the funeral of a young mother in Scotland. Some time before, I had paid her a pastoral visit. Back then, she shared with me how her medical consultant had explained to her that the condition which she had had since birth and which was killing her could potentially do the same for one or both of her teenage boys later on, later on in their lives. Both her and her husband were grappling with how and when to explain this to their children. I distinctly remember sitting in their beautiful living room with this spectacular seascape view as she calmly told me this deeply unsettling news. This side of the resurrection, we know the painful devastation that Simeon's words implied for the future of both Mary and her baby son. Jesus would lead a life of healing and teaching 
but increasingly he would come under the threat of suffering and death. Mary would experience great pain and agony at witnessing the injustice brought upon him until finally, as John's Gospel tells us, she would be present at the foot of the cross to watch him slowly die and presumably watch a soldier pierce his side with a spear. Whether we have a congenial condition like my former parishioner or not, I believe that Mary's experience can relate to the uncertainty and fear that many of us are experiencing just now, especially those of us who have children of whatever age. We are presently coping with many different forms of suffering incurred by a pandemic which has now persisted for nearly a year. And like many people, I am concerned for the burdens placed upon young families and families with teenagers and students as parents and guardians watch helplessly as their children suffer from the effects of long-term isolation and lack of in-person encounter. But in the midst of this, we might remember that Mary, as the mother of Jesus, carried hope as well as pain through her life. You see, when God called her into the life that she would lead, Mary announced her acceptance of God's will by praising God in what we call her Magnificat. This beautiful prayer is found one chapter back from our story today in Luke's Gospel. This and the other prayers that we can presume she would have prayed throughout her life appear to have sustained her even at the foot of the cross and beyond. And her life of prayer is validated by Simeon's response to the birth of Jesus in his own prayer of praise to God, known as the Nunc Dimittis, which the choir sang for us earlier in our service this morning. With the words of Simeon's prayer, may we acknowledge that we too have seen salvation in Jesus. In this prayer, we too are given a vision of peace that Simeon knew after such a long wait in the temple. Holding Jesus in his arms, he received such a peace that enabled him to accept his own death. And this is a vision of the same peace that sustained Mary through her life amid the suffering and worry for her son, Jesus. So may we be thankful then for Simeon's vision of peace, a vision where we too can acknowledge God's presence in our own lives, a presence of steadfast love and of faithfulness despite the pain anxiety and uncertainty of our times. May it be so, because it is to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit that we give both praise and thanksgiving, both now and indeed forevermore. Amen.
Now go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. And the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you, both now today and indeed forevermore.